That was some fantastic work there, Jesse. I mean, just very heartfelt and really illustrating how tempo plays a part in conveying expression, conveying emotion, and bringing out the meaning of the score. Now, this is just a terrifically huge score. <laughs> um, not so much in terms of using more instruments than normal, but just more in terms of using a lot of instruments, just very thickly textured um, at all times, right? Or, or not all times, but much of the time. All right, so we are going to look over it and think about it, and I will give you such tips as I feel might help you out and see if you can make this an even stronger score. Um, it, would, it is already a very strong score, um, you know, just like uh, many, even most of the scores that I've looked at in the dotted brev category. So, yeah, um, <laughs> it's actually a little, little overwhelming of a score. I think that there are some places where, like, the dynamics don't really mean anything, like, you know, mezzo piano crescendo to the middle of the bar and then you're already diminuendoing by the middle you know it doesn't really mean anything on harp right uh it might be better just to um go mezzo piano crescendo from the first beat to the third right or to excuse me excuse me to the next bar i meant to say and then after that go back down to mezzo piano because yeah i mean it it kind of doesn't make sense with only three uh, you know, three things happening over the course of this hairpin. Uh, this is kind of interesting how you bring in the uh, the middle strings, tremolo, under the melody. Um, you know, it's just, just a thought, and that is that, um, you know, you have to think how much does the melody need support how much do the supporting elements need to crescendo, right? So, because here you've got a different pattern. You've got your strings bustling and then fading away, whereas kind of very sparse elements of harmony in here um, are, are following the same arc as the melody. So do they actually need to crescendo? Does the harmony need to crescendo at all, right? Um, you know, like... I can see the point behind a crescendo on da, but you know, ba, ba. does that really need to happen, right? Because in the like, if you listen to the way the pianist plays it, like the um, the accompaniment is usually just kept in the background, and the and it's just the melody that has a little bit of nuance to it. Okay, um, so yeah. So there are lots of little bits and pieces, like you've got these little, um, you know, little ending the triplet with accented staccato, and I feel that these notes are going to be bigger than you think. You know, like an accented staccato on a um, on a wind instrument is really a kind of a biting sound, right? So um, yeah, so it it may you know it may stand out more than you expected in the uh, in the course of the texture right um so but just looking at the basic orchestration of it um i i don't really see any need for the second flute to play and then the first flute to play i think that it just really is the job of the first players to set the um you know to set the agenda right rather than just kind of everybody being a big um you know, big anarcho-syndicalist commune, um, right, and where everybody just takes turns, right? It's, I, I don't think it, I mean, I'm not trying to think hierarchically, but it's just more like, it's not so much a question of hierarchy uh, as it is a question of responsibility and artistry, right? So you want your, like, you want the beginning, you want your best player to be deciding how these shape, how these phrases are shaped. And I think you should stick with those best players anywhere that the um that it's really important to set the tone because like a lot of times the second players are really listening to the first players to see what they're going to do right 
So I would just say, look, just score this for first, um, you know, until you have other voices join in. Same thing for oboe. Now here you're having first bassoon um, play, so yeah, why not everybody on first? But, I mean, I can see what you're going for in here with this orchestration, you know, of this passage. I mean, throughout. You just really want fervent, you want, you want, um, you know, you want to hear the leaves rustling on the trees outside, right? And you want that to be reflected in the perspective, in the in the soul of the listener as they imagine Lily uh, channeling the music through her, right? I mean, I, I get that. I totally get that. So, um, just a few things, like you've got forte bassoons and, you know, forte winds right in here. You're really, you're holding your, um, your, your horns and lower heavy brass back. Um, all the same, it's kind of doubtful whether or not harp in this register will be audible in this context, right? So, I mean, wow, you're really taking pains to, um, to keep track of all of the different changes. But you know something? Like, the, the basic way that harpists like to look at this, like, the grid basically sets the pedals, right? Okay. And then what they need after they get their grid, their... Um, their harp pedal diagram, then they just want little um, little notes, right? To tell them, you know, uh, did Columbus bring, so that's B, right? In the upper position, it's flat. So you would just write a B flat just before this, right? So they see the roll on the B, and then they know that they're just going to slightly um, palm the string, like to to dampen the string and then and then change the pedal to B flat really quickly and then play this, right? So you would mark the B flat here at the end of the bar, just as in text, right? B flat, which I guess in Sibelius is or I I don't know, you I think you're using Dorico here, so I don't know what the sign is for that. So so B flat here then um here you are like you want things to go back to B natural, right? But there really kind of isn't any need for that until here. But yeah, and then then right here you want to go back to A natural, right, rather than A flat after this. So so yeah, so just like mark those as separate text rather than just giving a diagram every single time, right? Now here you're saying no ARP. Just and and then you have like a little thing. Okay, just say non ARP in like in text in the middle and don't worry about the you know, the, the harpist will follow that direction until you give her roll marks, give them roll marks. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so this is, um, so yeah, just, just like try to be a little bit more, you know, and the same thing goes for here. Just like, just mark the, if you're going to really go through it and be aware of all of the changes, then just mark them in text. Like, Maybe at the beginning of a passage, show the pedal layout on a diagram, and then just make little changes in terms of text from there on. It's it's really you know I, I have never seen a professionally engraved harp part that has diagrams every single time there's a change, right? You know what what a harpist would probably do is they would end up circling all of the different um, like the different changes in red. Like there'd be a little red circle around the diagrams if they were in a huge hurry, but they would probably just write it out in text, you know, in pencil. Um, you know, in, in either in the in here or down here. Sometimes some harpists prefer to write things out under the staff. Okay, so back to the actual orchestration instead of all of the little tweaking. Um, yeah, so so it, I mean, it, it works pretty well. I, I would just say you've got a lot of weight on the melody here right and not a whole lot on the accompaniment it's, there's really not a whole lot that the harp can offer in terms of um you know in terms of body of 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 weight in you know in in comparison to a line like this right like the harp is already at a disadvantage dynamically and of course as i said before you nobody's going to hear these middle three bars against um you know against what's happening 
So, um, so there are fixes, you know, you could have the harp an octave higher, or you could just leave it out, or you could, you know, try some other kind of thing, right? But definitely it has to be much louder, right? Now here you've got this, what kind of, um, you know, this, this thing, I, I just feel it's an affectation, you know, the, the whole, um, quarter note with a, you know, with a indeterminate tie after it. I feel you should just figure out how long you want this pizzicato to sustain and write out that, write out that duration, right? Um, I don't really see any need for this to be divisi in here, right? You, you know, I mean, just, just use the whole section. It's fine, right? I don't, I don't think that there's anything so delicate about this, especially considering, you know, how you are stacking octaves in your winds that really requires that the that you use half a section in your cellos. Um, now here, like you you have accented horns uh, at at a soft dynamic, okay, and then you are using pizzicato. So did you notice that there's kind of a it ended up kind of sounding grunty in the mock up, right? And um, Yeah, so so I think that the 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 possible a possible different uh, strategy here instead of accents would be uh, eighth notes with tenuto marks on them, right? I think that you want like a full note that like that pushes at the pizzicato, right? Um, but I think there's like the kind of the this the the kind of a punchy quality of this may actually not be, you know, I, I mean, I think you want a shove here instead of a punch, right? And that's why you're getting a grunt in your, in your mock-up, right? Not that the mock-up is necessarily accurate, right? You might get the same, you know, it, it would be better if you really want the punchy kind of sound, it would be better to have this staccato rather than accented, right? And yeah, and then you can accent your pizzicato here. That's all fine. But if you want kind of a shoving sound here, then I would say eighth note to nudo. Okay, and then the, all this climbing and all this other stuff is really nicely done. Okay, that's that's all good. I mean, you really notice there's very little, like besides for the pizzicato, there's kind of really little in the way of arco support Right, it's just really all down to horns and winds, you know, as they harmonize on the melody and so on. Yeah, but I mean, it all does end up working. Um, there's no need to put uh, ottava mark above piccolo at all, ever in this in the score anywhere. All right, just get rid of that and get rid of this ottava mark for the flutes as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like if you really want to condense things vertically. And you know, for the publisher, that that's one thing, but really make sure that this does not end up in the parts at all. Okay, um, so as I've commented on other scores, maybe people are getting sick of me mentioning this, but you know, what what does P mean on a high G in either piccolo or flute? You know, I mean, it is going to be a note that really stands out. Um, you know, with with a lot of with a lot of force, even softly, right? It'll it'll have an edge to it, right? So just be careful about that that high note up there. Now, like you're you're already hitting it with the harp, right? So you already have like a bit of a, you know, you always you already have like that note there as well, right? Okay, um, now <clears throat> going on to the development. Da 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 dum ba ba da dum. Okay, so as people will uh, know that I'll be looking for the da 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 da, you know, the actual melody, right? Da 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 da. Yeah, so there's a little bit of that there. I would say that you know, it sh you should also have some kind of doubling on the um, on that internal melody, um, right? Which which in in the key of C is E D. Right, and um, so I would say some doubling on that and the strings, just so that it's very clear and it's very smooth of you know what needs to be, what needs to happen in there. And this is interesting how you slur the resolution into 
the tenuto staccato, right? So just being aware, tenuto staccato has like an unga kind of um, kind of articulation. Unga, unga, unga. It's kind of like it's slightly bouncy, right? It's or sticky, right? It's like it's like um, you know, like uh, tapping your finger against the sticky side of cello tape, right? So it's just like you kind of feel it pull away as you pull your finger off of it, right? So that that's going to be the vibe there, unga, unga, unga. and that that works fine. You know, it's like a it's a bouncier kind of mezzo staccato. Yeah, and this is yeah this is all fine except the the brass need to come down in in level because at, at this you know with this kind of scoring, the winds are sort of um, just secondary. They they can't compete right. So and there's also the the added problem that you are. Um, going diminuendo past the, you know, past the resolution, which is serving as a pickup note to the next bar, right? So, I would say, make the diminuendo mark end here, right? Not past it, because it's really confusing. You know, they add the slur, and then they're going to here, and you have a you have a hairpin going, a hairpin from, you know, let's say this is sort of mezzo pianoish going down to mezzo forte. That doesn't make any sense, right? logically. So just end the hairpin um, before the third beat for everybody, I'd say. Um, and then here, see, like you're starting on mezzo forte for your for your brass, right? And and the, that is going to be louder than the winds. So what are the winds are, you know, what are they accomplishing at all here, right? You just have to ask yourself. The, uh, you know, mezzo forte third horn here is going to be louder, twice as loud as mezzo forte English horn. So you need to rethink your dynamics here, right? Maybe have your just back off on this, you know, you know what I would say? It's like the problem is like you're using the resolution as a pickup note and then the pickup note is stronger. So, you know, you don't get the sense of re relaxation, you know, Da, 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 da. Right, it sort of messes up the whole arc. Da 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 da. Right. So, what if you just give up on the pickup note entirely as a as a as a connection to the next bar, right? And just let it end. Da 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 da. Then mezzo forte, bump 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 bump. Just really cleanly separate out the two phrases from each other. You know, I think that that would be the way forward for that. This is kind of fun. The boo 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 boo. That's kind of it's sort of, you know, kind of adds a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, it's that kind of pacing. It's kind of like it's almost like you know Hollywood jungle drums kind of a kind of thing right in there. Um, right, and then I, I don't know. I don't know if this really worked. The the kind of the cross stick thing on the on the um, on the snare drum right in there but you know if it works for you that's fine um, you know, just in general uh, I rather than having two horns in F on each staff it would better to be better to have one in the middle four horns in F right and then you know that as far as the voicing is concerned you are definitely doing like one two three four in the in the standard layout and that's fine it's all good and I really like the use of the the partners together like this that's really wise scoring okay um, <laughs> now um, we are answering our tenuto staccato with accented uh, staccato so yeah so accented staccato is just a really specific thing like I mentioned before it is a kind of a biting staccato it's like a punch with the diaphragm along with a a like chopping things off with the embouchure right so it's really just precise as all hell you know and here you got that da, that da, 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 da. Uh, just really is going back and forth in it and this is actually pretty helpful and then you've got like so so this colenio here is just nobody's going to hear this sadly because it is like it is a you know I've talked about um, Celesta being like as loud as loud as it possibly is is really a mezzo piano kind of an effect and the same thing is true of Colenio you know you can have people beating the you can have the entire orchestra just hammering away 
Colenio, and you'd be lucky to get up to like a mezzo piano or a mezzo forte. So, you know, this is really going to be all just barely audible. Um, you know, um, sad to say. I mean, maybe, you know, it, I mean, it would be better to have like pizzicato plus wood blocks or something like that. You, you know, if you just really want to have that sound be bigger. But I mean, it's a, it's a neat, it's a cool idea, but yeah. And, um, I don't quite understand Colenio Unis Pizzicato Div Divisi. So you want it to be unison. I, I think I think the word you want is non divisi, right? Here at the end. So um, I mean, just thinking as a, um, I would make sure that the see the non divisi is just as important as the Colenio. So I would stack them on top of each other. So it's, you know, because otherwise the player might think, oh, oh, he wants me to play uh, non-divisi on the last beat. Right, so just have non-divisi, or so non-div, period, and then colenio um, on the next line. And just stack those above each other. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at that. I'm kind of thinking on the fingerboard. I mean, it's all really doable. I mean, it's just a little fussy to do perfect fifths. Um, you know, F and then the E fourth. And, you know, I would just keep, I would just leave it uh, divisi. There's just really no need for this to be non divisi. Right? Um, I mean, I, I know you want you want a louder sound with your colenio, but it's, it's a lost cause anyway. Okay. Um, but... On the bright side, this is going to work, but it is going to be just really just snapped off, you know, you know, bam, bam, bam. And then you have, ba -dum. that's kind of cool on your piccolo. Um, and then just a little bit more. And then <laughs> this is kind of wild. This is sort of like, you know, it's like your drunk aunt at the wedding going, woohoo. You know, swinging from the chandelier. <laughs> That's kind of kind of what this reminds me of right in here. It's just you know really, you know, or like a, um, you know, the there's like that movie about radio in the '40s where the guy next door goes crazy and starts running down the uh, running down the street half naked with a um, with a meat cleaver. That's kind of so sort of just the sudden appearance of something really wild and out there. Okay, um, yeah. So just. You know, nobody's going to hear the harp right in here. That's just like all, all that anybody can focus on is this. So, like, you just have to ask yourself, like, whether or not that is, is distracting from the meaning of the phrase here. The bum 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 bum. Right. I think, like, right once you get to right in here, you'll hear the harp. You know. So this may be wasted effort for the harpist. And then once again, just set the diagram and then just mark the changes as um as notes as um as text excuse me um but i mean it's still a cool effect uh, not not to take anything away and it's kind of cool that you're doing this with cup mute um so cup mute open or closed right it's not just a it's not just a thing you, you need to spe specify the effect, oh my god, my cat just came in and she is just, or he is, I can tell by holding the tail. My male cat has got a kink in his tail. He is just sopping. All right, come here, buddy. Lie down right there. Lie down right there. He's just looking for his warm, dry spot. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, this all works fine. I feel a little bit of a drop-off when we let go of the of the uh, trumpets right in here, but it it's still all right, you know, because you really want that relaxation, you know. Um, this is going to stand out though. Like, is everybody is everybody going to go crescendo to mezzo forte and back, right? So I don't think you really need to go. I think it's safe to just have this piano crescendo to pianissimo. I don't think you need to have this go. You know what I mean? It's just. It's just kind of like wowza, right? Um, it might be just a little too much to, and especially it'll interfere with the, you know, what's going on in the harp, like all of this. This is going to be like right here. This would be a lot of work for the harpist to put together. So it is 
especially important if you're going to ask the harpist to do something big and gorgeous and beautiful like this that they can be heard over the trumpet and they can't they there's no way right so you i think you're just gonna have to choose one or the other right do you want your wild aunt Mid mildred to swing from the chandelier as she whoops it up and embarrasses everybody at the reception or do you want your um graceful aunt esther to um bring down the house with a you know a very lucid speech about um how you know how much every you know the bride means to her and everybody gets out their handkerchiefs and you know and they all have a good cry right so you have got a choice right crazy aunt or elegant aunt okay bum da 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 ba da 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 bum 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 okay yeah so and once again i don't feel like you need to lead into um you know that that you, I don't think you need to pick up into phrases. I think that that Lily has already determined how the phrases should flow through the piece, right? So I don't think you need to bridge over. Um, yeah, and and you do not need to like just tell us how long you want the pizzicato to be. Don't give it a don't give it an indeterminate, you know, like LV kind of thing. I mean, yeah. I, I just don't think this is any of this is necessary at all, right? Just just say how long you want the pizzicato, pizzicato to be and just notate it, okay? So if you want it to last for two beats or three beats even, just notate that. And when you do, mark it sostenuto, right? And that's, that, sometimes that is, sometimes all you have to do is just have a single note without any fancy stuff and just say sostenuto, right? And then the player will just hold their finger on for longer. Okay. Um... Okay, so this is, yeah, this is fine. Tremolo with, you know, with your wins and everything else. That's that's all it balances. The scoring is good. Yeah, that's all, it's all fine. Okay, getting really, really big in here and having accented and tenuto, excuse me, accented tenutos and staccatos. Um, that's just... You know, there's no possible way that the strings can compete with that or the winds, right? So you just you you have to make a choice here. Start pianissimo and go to mezzo forte in your horns and trumpets, right? If you want this to balance, otherwise forget it, right? And this, you know, these clarinets should start. You know, they should be forte here, not mezzo forte, right? And then diminuendo to pianissimo in the brass, uh, and then you know everything else is fine. This this works. This is good. Okay, now here, you know, you've got a chance. the The harp has got a chance of being heard, um, for the most part, right? Just as long as this doesn't, you know, so long as the first trumpet player does not get any ideas. Okay, cup me open or closed or what? Okay. Um, Yeah, so ah two clarinets. This is kind of going to have a sort of a band feel to it, with you know, with um, unison clarinets like that. Yeah. Bum, and then a little resolution. Now here you go back to a, you know, a really lovely, pleasant um, kind of pastoral kind of a feel here and, and I really like this you know um, I would actually prefer uh, trill with a line and just to see how far it goes because it's you know this is going to get a raised hand in rehearsal like the second flute player is going to say excuse me at B uh, at letter B do you mean for the trill to go throughout the entire phrase or do you just want it on that one note or do you want it like a really short one or what do you want there right so I would say just like have your little jaggy line end here if that's what you mean or just continuing on right under the second part and just really be absolutely clear what you want because this is unclear right and the second flute or the first flute player might think well you know he's got the trill and maybe I'm supposed to trill too and they'll raise their hand right so you just want to keep all that stuff down to a minimum because every question that gets asked 
you know, which takes, um, you know, you try to answer it quickly, like tell them exactly what you want. And, you know, with as few words wasted as possible, because, you know, every minute is $75 or, or $180, right? Okay. Um, and this is neat, you know, your A2 oboes. So my suggestion here is uh, solo first oboe rather than two oboes, because the problem with two oboes is that um, they have a harder sound, right? They do not like tw twice the oboe power is not twice the um, twice the poetry. It's half the poetry, right? So twice the oboes is half the poetry. And if and it is it is actually a harder sound, right? It has a kind of an edge to it. Um, as opposed to the kind of the more softer, beautiful, um, vibrant uh, sound of, of a single oboe, right? The more poetic sound. But, and that will support the, uh, the violin solo so much better. Like a single oboe will support the violin solo way, way better than two oboes. Like the two oboes will actually tend to dominate the sound right in there, okay? And um, it gets a little involved in here. I, I think the, I like this part right in here. I'm not so sure that adds to the, you know, to the meaning. Like if you went, you know, A, B, C, D, right? If you like, you know, um, if you, and like basically like um, did like a slurred, like A to B, C to, C to D, you know, so that you are um, sitting on top of this melody. Yeah, once again, unclear. I don't know what this means, right? The second second flute player would like to know how long this lasts, if it is a continuous thing over the phrase, whatever, right? Because they're hearing, they're also listening to the bass clarinet player play their trill for two bars, so it's kind of confusing things, right? Um, but I don't think you have to go so far as to tell the first player not to trill, to, play, to tell the first flute flute player not to trill. Now see, here you could get away with two players, right? Da, da. So if you want one of them to continue on holding that D and then the other one to drop, right? Then that would be a good place to come in with the second player, but just the first player for the first bar. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, pretty much this will work just as long as the destination dynamic here is piano right? And the destination dynamic here is forte. Then your harp has a chance of being heard. So, yeah, and, and you know, start mezzo piano, not pianissimo. Okay, and this is really cool. I really love the way that the bassoon emerges from the darkness, right? And then the English horn builds on top of that, and then the bass clarinet comes in with the clarinets, and... Yeah, I just think that that is a really lovely way of doing it. And you end up like not really having to have a big high note here in the piccolo that is hard to uh, tame, right? And you just really leave up, you leave the real work here to the first violin. Um, you know what? Your ottava mark should start like right here, okay? And then I think you could leave that in the part because you're just going so incredibly high there. You know, you're going up to to G. So, I mean, you just think have to think like how how many how many um, ledger lines do they have to count? So, in, in you know, all the way up to C is fine, and certainly this F is readable. But you want to make it a part of the same phrase, right? So start your ottava here. Right, so like when you get above C, you know, even E, that's totally readable by a violinist, but you're ending up, you're heading for G, right? So that gets a little up there. But you know, right here, like you might even want your, you might want to completely get rid of the ottava altogether and then just have this G played as, um, you know, have this G, um, could possibly be played since as a solo instrument yeah you know you know what I would do is I would just have like um, see if there's some way I mean I think any soloist worth their snuff 
um, with their stuff, excuse me, could um, could play like um, play both of these as artificial harmonics, right? So just get rid of the ottavo mark, score all of these where they should go, and then end with two artificial harmonics, you know, two octaves below with the with the fourth node. And I think you will get what you need. Okay. Um, yeah, so is this more... I'm not sure if this came through in the mock-up, if this is more side stick here. But, I mean, it just seems really kind of, you know, kind of um, abrupt, if so. You know, it, uh, compared to this just delicate, beautiful... You know, there's kind of this weird tapping in the background. Um, yeah, but every, everything else works great. Okay, so so here, like the the very last thing is is a mistake that you just cannot fix using the instruments that you've got. Right, you're sending your horn player all the way up to high C on a pianissimo, you know, heading back to pianissimo in a diminuendo. Right, so this just is not possible. Um, I would say, like pianissimo is possible up to this F, and you know, it's sort of this G. Right, so maybe piano on this G is still going to stick out. It would be better just to give this right here to a couple of to your, you know to two trumpets, and it would sound fine, especially with you know with a horn underneath it. All right, and now we get we're into the you know the rustling in the underbrush, right? The uh, you know little sort of sort of thinking of the emotional reaction here, right? Um, and it's interesting that there are so many different ways of dealing with this, you know, just to have like a growing sense of anticipation or to, you know, to setting setting up a moment of pure reverence at the end. Um, I think it's really cool that you are, you know, that you are using the harp right in there in that way. I completely approve. And I, I think that this is the right kind of dynamic to use. I think you could still, I think the, that you're... Um, your hairpin here could cross the, um, you know, could could go across the um, the stems, the crossover stem with no problem, and you could just still keep the dynamics inside the, you know, rather than dropping them below. Okay, and then here you say sim arp. Look, all you need to do is just say, um, is just have the roll and just say, arp, you know, arpe arpeggiando, and then the harpist will just do it for the rest of it. You don't need to have a big dashed line. That's just too many, too many dashed lines, right? And this is fine, just giving the harpist a diagram each time, right? But look, even even saying that that that's all right. Um, Really, like just looking at the whole logistics of this, the place where you know, like the, probably what a harpist would be happy with is diagram at the pedal change. All of these could have just been dealt with with um, just notating um, text. So, harp pedal diagram at the at the uh, at the rehearsal mark. Sorry, and then then just notating the changes. Uh, in uh, in text. Okay, and you know, and you take a very simple approach here, but that is nonetheless very emotionally effective, right? It's just it really, you know, you you sort of stick to the same strategy, um, and you know, what's really really cool are the kind of um, the Beatles era <laughs> psychedelic cellos and and strings sort of effect that we have we end up with here just you know in the in the mock-up I thought that was kind of fun that they were really kind of doing a you know George Harrison style strings um, like within you and without you uh, kind of a kind of an approach to interpreting which is not exactly what you'll get you know there was a bit of um, of involuntary portamento right in here uh, that sounded really cool, though. I thought that was really fun. I, I wouldn't say to, I I would say don't put in portamento or glissando slides in there. <laughs>
that that's going a little too far but the hint of it is nice okay um i think that you could this can just be pianissimo rather than triple p okay um yeah and def but definitely triple p on your tuba okay yeah i mean it all really works great if you're going to give yeah i think i think all of your all of your little rustling underbrush people need a destination dynamic in the middle of the hairpin. You know, this is just so that they know that they are increasing, and it's 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 you know they have more to rely on than just the elbow of the conductor and how big that to get right in here. Right. But I I do like the build. I think that like if the melody is going to build in intensity, I think the accompaniment has to also you know maybe. You know, from here it could be pianissimo, and from here it could be piano, right? And then here you could you could crescendo to a forte in the accompaniment. So it just I think the dynamics need a little bit of a rethink. And once again, look, you've got two beats to fill here in your pizzicato. Just score a, you know, just score a half note. All right. Okay. Yeah, and just a touch of a gong by gong, you mean tam tam, right? Okay, um, and you know here is where I felt this, um, you know this this kind of um, very expressive tempo alterations. I thought it was really really great. It really made this feel almost like a harp concerto at the end. That was really nice. Okay, now the Piece de resistance, the ending. So, bum, 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 bum. So bright. You want, uh, okay, so just to let you know, like, there just really is no way for the piccolo player to hit a high A here um, and and to still be soft. Okay, so just like you, if you get above E, the piccolo becomes harder and harder, like it, uh, more and more intense in, in its, you know, the kind of more whistling, more uh, blocky kind of a sound. By blocky, I sort of mean that the overtones become so strong that they are almost like a block, like a Lego block pushing into your ear hole. Okay, so it's, you know, the the D and the E, I'll grant you, but the but the A. You know the A and the G, forget it, right? You, you know you would be better off here if you really must have the if you really must end on this E and D. Then I would say just drop the G and the A an octave, and you'll get what you want there, right? Because you already have got some of these pitches going on in your strings, so this needs to sort of be rewritten. I would I would say at this point, expand out to divisi staves, and in fact. Like you're going to have, you know, I, I really am hoping that you finalize your score and you you see if it can be performed um, or read or something like that by a, a real orchestra. But I would say from this point right here, split your firsts into divisi staves and just have you know the two different parts on it, and then here like just divide this up and try to have uh, this octave melody played in artificial harmonics. Okay, it's perfectly possible to do this in artificial harmonics at the slower tempo and everything. The whole section should be able to do it, and then you can give the, you know, you can give this, um, the A right in the middle here to the lower, um, the lower divisi staff. Or, yeah, I mean, solo. So I guess the top. All right. So you intend this. I'm not. I don't understand this solo maybe you intend the solo violinist to be playing these octaves at the end and then so all right if that is the case then don't worry about um don't worry about artificial harmonics but yeah just give this this staff right in here um would be on the lower staff this a would be on the lower staff and then the top staff, you could just have your solo part and me mention it here, not at the end. Okay, so 
Um, or is the solo meant to be the A? I just cannot tell with the way that this is notated. So if, if you intended the A to be the solo violin, then it should be under the note. Okay. And the, the dynamics should be over, right? So if like, you intend this to be pianissimo below and yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a little too crammed in there. All right. Anyways, I would say fix that. It, I think you would get the best effect here with just the section, right? Forget about the solo violin. Um, just make it make it a whole section. Put the um, give the A to the uh, second staff, second divisi staff, and then the first divisi staff have octaves, um, octave artificial harmonics, just to make it really easy to play and also very very. You know, you want clear. You know, you want bright. Right? You want a really bright, beautiful, soft tone in there, right? I don't know if going up to forte or sorry, excuse me, up to mezzo forte. I mean, I really love the way that things surge here. I think that's beautiful. I don't know if you need to go up to mezzo forte in your um, in your violins. Um, I think that you know, I think that mezzo piano is strong enough. Okay, um, and so here you want this big Leando. All right, so. Do, do we have a discussion about this in another score that you had me look at, whether or not you could do Bispigliando loud? You can't. I did. Even for a harp, Bispigliando is a pianissimo effect when it's done correctly, right? And you are unfortunately on a pitch that cannot be played enharmonically, right? Like your A and G. Right? They they cannot be played enharmonically with anything. So you might be better off like um, alternating octaves um, like so just having um, a in the left hand a in the right hand in octaves and just kind of plucking back and forth between them like you know in broken octaves uh, and then here yeah just you know this big yeah it's just is really complicated the problem with this big Leandro is that you need two hands right so you're asking somebody to play two-handed and then and then they they're supposed to jump down here and play this and then here I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, right? So just study a little bit more on Bisbigliando. It's really a, it is a, um, it is an effect that really requires two hands first in the first place. In the second place, it is better alternating between two enharmonic pitches, which is impossible in the key, you know, in this key and on those notes. Um, and also, like the, the most important thing is that it is really a quiet effect. It is such a soft effect. Forget about mezzo forte. You will never hear effective bispigliando above a whisper, right? It is literally means to whisper. So this is not going to work. I'm so sorry to say that. But, you know, there are other things you could do here. You could do little soft glissandos. You could do, um, you know, you could do harmonics. You could do um, little... Um, uh, like you could do little Salzedo technique things. Uh, there's a bunch of different things you could do. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, just in, just in terms of the scoring, you know, bum 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 bum. You got bass clarinet on that and and cello. I mean, that's that's all gonna work fine. And you know, that and the melody just. You know, just as long as everybody really keeps soft, like you really have a big mass of, you have a you have a very you have a lot of accompaniment there, okay. But don't worry, you're you know that's why I think that this should be section instead of solo, right? I guess I'm thinking solo must be that A, but I mean whatever it is, I think that this should be the whole section and they should be they should definitely be playing together. And if you felt like adding yet another voice to this you know, um, then that would be cool too. And there's absolutely no need whatsoever for Hataba on on these flutes. Okay, so wow, um, another long evaluation. There just was a lot to say and a lot to pick apart and a lot to try to help you make this a stronger score. So um, yeah, so, man, I hope that that's useful. And, um, and you know, just like I was, I was saying before, there's just really, there's no need to defend this. 
There's no need to um, to tell me why you did one thing one way or another. Just take whatever advice I've got that's useful and just you know throw away the rest. Do not worry about it. Um, this is totally not a critique on you or anything else. It's just my thoughts, you know, from my perspective of craft um, as a pro orchestrator. So, you know, I mean, this is just really, really good work. You got nothing to defend yourself against. I just really am hoping that you can just take what's useful and 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 make this stronger if it needs to be stronger. And yeah, d just don't score pianissimo on a high C with horn. And you know, and just and and yeah, see if you know, see what this sounds like live. That would be my big suggestion. So, thank you so much for your support, for your involvement in the community. I think you came into the community about a year ago or so and sort of discovered us and started participating and supporting on Patreon, for which I'm very grateful. And you, know, you just always have some have great suggestions and thoughts and are very, very kind to your fellow orchestrators. And I appreciate that so much. So, uh, you know, it just is really great for us to have this conversation. <laughs> you know, you sending me the, uh, uh, the entry and me giving you the evaluation. I just, you know, it really, I feel like that kind of validates um, you know, our interaction in the community. Um, it's really great to touch bases with so many people um, every year in this way. So, and, you know, and a score like this, where you really have put so much thought into it and gotten so much expression and meaning out of it, you know, that really does mean a lot. So, so thank you very much. Thanks everybody watching. And I am on to my next evaluation now.